CodeBuddies.org live coding session. CodeBuddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. Today we will be continuing working on the Western Friend magazine subscription online community website. Western Friend is the official publication of Quakers in Pacific, North Pacific, and Intermountain yearly meetings. These are large groups of Quakers in the Western United States, but that community is sort of international also. There are um, members of PYM in Mexico, I'm in Finland, uh, and I think there's other people who join the session from Europe, for example. So this website uh, has a lot of features. We're porting it from Drupal to Wagtail CMS. Uh, the Drupal side of things was developed over the course of five years, so we set out with some initial plans and, you know, sort of those evolved naturally. Everything's point and click in Drupal, so it's sort of, uh, for the most part, easy to add new features and change things. But we decided to move to migrate, uh, sorry, to migrate to Wagtail because um, we were going to need to upgrade our infrastructure, for say our server, and then also the uh, web framework Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 and we were just having a lot of um, well difficulties I couldn't migrate them uh, between long-term support port versions of Ubuntu because PHP errors kept happening I don't know exactly the cause um, a lot of our Drupal modules were keeping us from making the transition to Drupal 8 so we were like well uh, also we realized we would need to um, probably start writing some custom code getting a little bit deeper into the framework. And so we were like, okay, well, what would be the alternative? Like, just so we have something to compare. And around that time, I was um, started to become aware of Wagtail, CMS, uh, and I've been a long time, uh, I've had a long time interest in Django, but never the sort of opportunity to learn it. I haven't taken the initiative. In any case, uh, as I started looking at this Wagtail CMS, and I've got a background in web development, starting with, um, WordPress and Joomla and Drupal, mainly PHP relating related projects. This Wagtail augments Django framework, which is a sort of a low level framework. It's got a lot of abstractions in there, so it's not really you know bare metal that, at that low level or something. Um, with it augments it with um, a user experience that's similar to WordPress. Uh, and the developer experience from even the times I've gone down to the level of Django code, um, but up into the um, layer of uh, Wagtail has been very excellent. And the interactions I've had with the Wagtail core team have been just, I don't know, superb. Um, sometimes they've gently guided me over to Stack Overflow to ask a question. Sometimes they've reopened an issue that was closed because they, it seemed like a support request where it actually turned out to be a feature request, semi-feature, semi-bug. They've implemented features that I've asked for, um, not that I've been like, you know, assuming they should do that or kind of lobbying for that, but it, it was just a really nice touch. I asked for a specific feature, how to limit the number of instances for a particular um, model uh, class. And uh, I don't know if I have an example here, but uh, they added an attribute to the page model that says um, max count or something like that. So you can say, well, there should only be one instance of this um, landing page, for example. In any case, um, that's where we are. We're migrating from Drupal to Django Wagtail. Uh, in the last session, I also migrated from PipM to Poetry. So we'll continue working with Poetry today to see how things work. So I have my project Tomo there. And I need to get rid of the requirements.txt now. It's uh, I realized um, we're getting, uh, pip, uh, GitHub is notifying us uh, that our dependencies uh, have security vulnerabilities, and I think that's because this requirements text is lingering, um, and we're not using it. So PyProject Toml is what we're using here because we switched to poetry. So let me just commit that. And uh, we'll create a branch and start on some feature work today. Uh, last session was kind of a maintenance session. And today is going to be some feature work. But first, T. By the way, that catchphrase I've, I've stolen from, um, what do you call 
Okay, in Ray Harmony. Yeah, they're these. Uh, they have this channel called Hack Music Three, uh, under the name of Revolution Harmony. Uh, Kate Harmony and Ray Harmony, really great, high energy, really positive attitude, uh, excellent uh, music theory instructors, dynamic. They keep things really short and um, applicable. You can just take the knowledge that you learn in one of their videos and apply it right away. It's a pretty cool channel. So. We do a little bit of uh, music theory on this channel as well. Okay, so enough endorsement of Wagtail and other YouTube channels. Uh, and this is the previous project. So today, the, I'm gonna work on one to three features, I think, depending on how smoothly they go. They seem to be relatively um, sort of low hanging fruit. In other words, like not too much um, not too many moving parts, pretty conventional coding flow, the way I've thought about it at least, and there's even a plugin for one. Um, so we're gonna try to add, allow um, user-defined menus um, so that the editor can manage the main menu of the site primarily. And then we are going to, and there's a plugin for this Wagtail Menus plugin, I've noted that. We are going to also uh, work on an initial contact form just so I can learn how to, how to develop forms in Wagtail. Uh, they have a methodology for that, so to speak. And one of the big uh, features that are important in terms of significance um, in the community section of the website are these memorial minutes. Um, we have a community page and memorial minutes. This is a top level uh, feature. It's to highlight um, members of the Western Friend community and Pacific Yearly Meeting, Intermountain Yearly Meeting, and North Pacific Yearly Meeting who have um, passed away and give a little bit of biography. And it should also have search and filtering capabilities. So I'm not sure if I will, we'll see how far we get on this one today. We'll put the initial data model in place. I'm, I'm pretty sure that would be um, feasible. And might be able to do I'll have to look at a way of doing some sort of fast sitting, basically the, or sorting. Okay, this sorting might not be too hard. Well, we'll get into it. So we're not gonna start with this feature, but uh, it's gonna follow a conventional flow. We're gonna have a memorialist page, which is like a landing page or a splash page. Uh, or an index page that lists the memorials. It'll have some editable text and the title can be edited. Um, then the lower half of the page will be the functional uh, part that um, sort of enumerates the content and lets you filter it. Um, and then we'll hopefully be able to add that to the menu. So let's go to the f first feature. This allow a user to define and arrange navigation menu items. I was thinking, well, yeah, I could probably just do this feature on my own, write the code. And the kind of code we're writing in Wagtail has been pretty high level stuff. So, um, I wasn't expecting to have to write, uh, well, in terms of by high level, I mean that you you define things in terms of your, your what would we call like business logic or um, aspect of the world you're modeling. Uh, so it's in just terms that you understand and you can communicate directly with people who are involved in the community or process, people who are stakeholders. And you can say, oh yeah, we have an event, and events have descriptions, start and end dates. That's all just really easy to understand. Uh, it's not very uh, far removed from the way people are already thinking about them. Then we get into a little bit of uh, wagtail specific stuff where you say, well, we're going to have to display a form, so we should have these fields in that form. And we also want this content to come up in our search index, right? So let's make that searchable, which we will want those um, uh, memorial minutes to be searchable. So we'll come back to this. And then Wagtail uh, does the search indexing for you. Even uh, fuzzy searching, it looks like. Uh, then you have this content hierarchy you can define uh, where you allow certain content to 
fall under other content, you can constrain that hierarchy both looking up and down in both of those directions. So you can be pretty strict, uh, say, not adding a memorial minute in the bookstore, for example. Or not adding an event, now, you know, an event in the bookstore or the magazine. Uh, you know, it's um, pretty powerful. Uh, then we can uh, define the table. I should actually be just doing this all, all the time because um, by default it's going to prefix the table uh, with the name of the Django app. All right, so let me just get started. Cool beans. Uh, we will create a branch. I'll push this up there. So that we don't get our, when I branch off master, I don't want to get out of sync. And we'll create a new branch. And this will be navigation menu. Okay, so we're creating branch in VS Code. You can see that on the screen. Sometimes um, some of the on screen elements from VS Code or other programs don't appear in the live stream. So I'll just kind of keep an eye on that. And we're going to open the code browser over here. And I think um, we'll need a new app for this. I've done a little bit of work tweaking the, the uh, IDE theme. And, uh, hopefully, it's more readable now. High contrast fonts. Um, these icons can be helpful. But most of them concerned that the code is easy on my eyes, but also that it's legible in the stream because that's the reason we're here, is to see how the code is written. So I've got the Wagtail Menus plugin documentation open. This is the GitHub repo. Let's just take a look. So my process when I'm looking at, uh, you know, usually open source libraries or projects, or, in, you know, incorporating a library into a project, I want to see, you know, is this thing alive? And how long has it been around? So this has been around for a, a little while. And it's had, a, you know, for the size of a Wagtail menu plugin, it's had a consistent, steady amount of work from one main developer and then some, what I kind of call drive-bys or some, something like that. I'll find a better way of describing that. But these little bumps here where somebody's added a feature or made a bug fix. So that's the mo most of it is uh, this one developer. And I'll just really quick check the developer's activity. Okay, they seem to be pretty active. Maybe in the holiday season they're coming. Uh, down in activity, relaxing a little bit. Uh, but the main thing is here, I don't want this you know, package already to be dead on arrival, so to speak, for lack of a, for a poor. And I'll, I don't want to bring in a project that's not maintained anymore uh, or have to fork this to maintain it. But it looks, it looks OK. And the code, It looks pretty complicated. So that's, an, that's another thing. If I had to maintain it or fork it, uh, is all this complexity going to be beneficial? It could be. Like Wagtail has a lot of complexity, but it also is a very, uh, very good framework. Same with Django. So maybe this, this complexity is going to be something orders of magnitude better than I could achieve in my uh, naive menu implementation. Fairly well documented though, so if I did have to dig into it, every all these methods have doc strings. Yeah, so I'm not going to think too much harder on this. Um, I think in this case I will use the navigation menu. I just want to get this one down the road and look. It lets you do hierarchical menus, even nested menus. So that's that's a nice benefit. Better control over top level menu items, links to pages, custom URLs, or a combination of both. So that's cool. You could have offsite links, which I, I do sometimes. We mix things. Uh, like if you have a discussion forum that's hosted on another platform, you add that. 
It works on multi-site projects. That's really cool. Although this Western Friend website is just one organization, uh, we do have another project on this live stream that's uh, going to be using multi-site functionality. So you can have custom menus defined for each site. Nice. I wonder how this will work if you say you have to have a navigation menu uh, and only one instance of navigation menu. Can you define specific menu types to render in specific parts of the template or do you have, is that like a bespoke thing? So this is similar to Drupal that um, when you're creating Drupal content, for example, uh, you specify whether it should be appear in the menu. And I am hard coding menus currently. And those pages may or may not come into existence, or they come into existence with a different page slug than my hard coded slug. All right, so it looks like it's going to have a main menu context uh, or object, I don't know what that would be called, but that'll be the target here that will render into the top level template. And I like this documentation. This is a good sign that not only is the code pretty well documented and easy to read, it's Python and Django and Wagtail code, which kind of enforces those, or that concept, but it's also just a lot of care has been taken to make sure people can come at this project and get an idea of how it works. There's a main menu tag and a flat menu, and it looks like this flat menu tag. You'll have to hard code the um, name of the menu. Hmm. So some templating is necessary. I'll have to think about that. Yeah, Wagtail is not a drag and drop CMS. So it's like there's sort of a fuzzy line about what should be done to the UI and what should be done in code. And generally it's um, adding content is done to the UI and everything else is in code, like defining your model. Um, Templating all you know design all that's done in code But this menu is a sort of hybrid thing it crosses that boundary because Your menus can't be static and the pages in the menu aren't necessarily known uh, Before the application is run before you create the page in the database. So uh, Menus are a special case here So let's go ahead and just follow these installation instructions Where was there installing wagtail menus? So uh, we're not using pip, we're so poetry. And let me just double check everything's installed. Uh, which it should be. Now, poetry doesn't deviate from um, PyP, the Python packaging index. Uh, it just adds some nice uh, touches, some enhancements there. So it looks like um, yeah, some of these things, uh, flake eight and PyFlakes, PyCode style. Huh. Interesting. Maybe that's because I had flake eight an hour ago. Did those other ones come in there? I'm not sure. I hope that didn't come out of Wagtail menus. I think that's because I put Flake 8 in my um, dev dependencies. All right. All right, see, so I'm in the, I'm in the shell. Uh, we can run it, and then we'll need to add Wagtail menus to our installed apps, which is in the settings, base settings. 
this project structure is um, uh, it's how Wagtail defines your project when you use Wagtail to scaffold it. Uh, so I have in our installed apps at the top, the apps I've created. In the middle were the default apps that were added through Wagtail Installer. And then I've been, it looks like, just sloppily um, adding, appending to this list for the dependencies, which I'll do again, but in this case it's some sort of alphabetical. Auto Pepe is not installed. Yes, so let's see. I like the Auto Pepe. Have been using Black for a while, but I think we'll just go with Auto Pepe this time. So let's see. Is this getting the wrong? No, targeted the right one. Now I'm a little bit, let's see. Let me just get these to be meaningful commits. Oh, dang. Just check the commits here on the master branch. Install flick eight. I'm just going to try to do these uh, as meaningfully as possible. So this should only include auto pep eight. Oops. No. There we go. That be a record. Dragon go cogwheels. All right, there we are. It's a little bit cleaner. Let's see what this Django cogwheels is. This could be useful if we have um, configuration options that we want, uh, like custom theming choices or something like that. I don't know how this works, but all right, cool. Basically store them in the database. That's Jingo Cogwheel, so it seems like it's a kind of a low level detail. I won't worry about too much. Very cool. So we've got it installed. We'll need to run migrations.
so I can go at the end. Let's just see how this works without auto-populating it. I um, see that's a nice, uh, if I've already added the content, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at how this works uh, and how just in general Wagtail lets you define content and make this more meaningful. Okay, so we'll get the server running. When I control click that link, it opens in the wrong browser, unfortunately. All right, so I'm gonna log in. Uh, just by way, by way of uh, example, this is a hard-coded um, navigation menu, and I mean hard-coded. It, it's like literally just the URL um, relative path, uh, which doesn't always line up when you create the content, or the content might not exist. Whoops, in that case, that exists, but this one doesn't. So, uh, yeah, it's just been to get me down the road. But we'll go back here and log in. Tech. Oh, it's got a little wagtail icon. So just for context, in case uh, new viewers aren't familiar with wagtail, uh, everything, no, not, not everything, but uh, wagtail has this default thing called a page model, which most of the things I've had to define in this project have been pages. Every page has a title and a lot of other functionality. That comes by default, like auto-generating slugs, a, a drafting flow, um, which whether or not the page is live yet, um, some SEO stuff, whether it should be shown in menus. Uh, and this is the interesting thing that they have this uh, thing for whether or not it should be shown in menus, but there's no default functionality I'm aware of in Wagtail to actually define a menu or anything. And as you see, we're installing a uh, plugin for this, so. It's kind of strange that they added this, but maybe haven't developed it out, or I, I think that they intentionally left this to be solved in the ecosystem. In any case, that's fine. Uh, you even have like ability to schedule publication. Uh, it's pretty cool. All of this comes for free, search indexing just by inheriting from the Wagtail menu. And max count, I think was the feature that they added. Where I opened up feature request. Pages are hierarchical, meaning they can have children. So we have this root level page, the welcome page, which is like the site home. When we go to the site, right here, we see this welcome page. Every site, Wagtail is also multi site. Oh, here's our menu, it's nice. So every site, here's the only one site you find here, it's our default site. When I edit this, we choose the root page, uh, which is sort of the home page. So there we are, and uh, this welcome page is our root. When I go into it, now we see it's got some child pages, children. So actually, if I actually click here, uh, I can also view it over here, and I can add child pages. There's several types. I'll just go ahead and add. Body's welcome. Body's required. You have to have at least one heading, welcome. And we'll publish it. I like this. This is the Wagtail stream field. It's another, ah, and this has actually gotten some improvements in the recent versions of Wagtail. I didn't even realize. So if I publish this wing, I can view it live. Now you can see we have the title, uh, subheader, and some paragraph text. And then when I go back here, I can edit that. Man, very nice, very nice. And it looks like what's this for? Oh, this is the type of thing. And then you can change the ordering of stuff. And delete. 
All right, so let's go back to the welcome page. It's got that nice breadcrumb navigation. There are so many little details that the Wagtail provides for you out of the box. It's a really great experience. Like I say, I think it's on par or approaching the usability of WordPress. Uh, but without all like the ecosystem problems that I've uh, encountered in the WordPress plugin and uh, template ecosystems, which are just a mess, everything is freemium. It's fragmented, a lot of duplications. You don't know which plugin to install. Sometimes you need multiple plugins to do the same thing, but each one of them does has a s different feature set, and they're not compatible. They're and then you get spammy messages like upgrade to pro. It's just really. Uh, unfortunate. I've stopped using WordPress many years ago because of that and switched to Drupal was great. Um, a lot more cohesion in that community um, and things are integrated so they can have you know overarching security policies and things like that. Uh, and then now moving to Wagtail and Python ecosystem is also very refreshing in terms of actually writing code and yeah I'm just not, I'm not looking back basically. So let's just go ahead and create the events page. We might just be able to scaffold our initial um, navigation menu. And what it's going to do is it's going to consider this welcome as our home page and everything under the welcome is um, uh, the navigation menu more, so, more or less. So, which is maybe not the uh, ideal situation, but in your case we'll be able to change it because some of these index pages don't go into the navigation they're there so that um, the editor can have a clean way of defining introductory text at the top that displays above the content um, why else uh, mostly that and that there's a namespace like these facets departments and uh, tags uh, they just need to be namespace slash tag, the tag name. And um, there's not even a body here. So actually, I could probably just refactor this so it doesn't inherit from the Wagtail page model. Anyway, this is a feature I worked on a while ago. All right, so we'll leave these out. Now, if I look back at the uh, welcome, it's got a bunch of things in... Some kind of order. If I disable sorting, then I can actually specify the order here. Um, so that's cool. And I wonder if this generating the navigation menu will do that. Let's give it a try. So I'm going to leave these two tabs open to remind myself of the other features I'd like to try to work on today. Although, how far we're at 30 minutes into the stream. So this is going to auto-populate the main menu and add the home link. And add home links ignored. Explicit argument. All right, so that's. Oh, I see, I see. Uh, well, it says error, so I should have checked. Now if we go to settings, main menus, oh yeah, I'm not running this server. Does the server need to be running when I do that? Hmm, no, it's a migrating migration thing. All right, run the server again, main menu, edit. Uh, let's just, so it's got our welcome page, subscribe page, magazine page, bookstore, so yeah, it did it community. Now it's got a lot of fields that are not relevant and these ideally would be collapsed. If I'm linking to a page then these would be conditionally shown. But anyway, um, just because it makes a lot of scrolling a little bit awkward to manage the menu. But it worked. It worked. Very cool. Uh, now let's go to the docs and see how to actually render it here. Oh, well, we run this once because it's creating the in the database. Mm -hmm. So uh, use the main menu's inline panel to 
define the root level items, so we kind of already got that. Flat mirror list, we're not going to define another one. Rendering menus, the main menu tag. Load menu tags. So for this, I will create, hmm. I guess I will create an app. Do I need to create an app here? Not until we have multiple menus, though we might have multiple menus. Let me double check how this works. So this is introducing some new complications. And it does have a templating component, so for every, hmm, that's what I was kind of afraid of. So you can define an arbitrary menu here, but then like, how do I get it into that UI? Hmm. Maybe I just don't know yet, but I mean, it looks like the templating is done, ah, too many tabs. You know, through code, I don't know. There's a little disconnect there. Could lead, it could be a source of confusion. And honestly, I've been using Wix lately also, just to get a feel for it. And you know, you define everything is visual drag and drop there. So you define something and you just drag it and drop it into the template where you'd want it to be. And uh, granted, Wagtail is not Wix and that have different design philosophies. But when we start to get on this level, there should be a way. Hmm. Like uh, Wagtail does not do drag and drop design. I like that, and the way I was considering this is you would have a class that says main menu class, and, uh, and then you can create the main menu. This is more flexible. Okay. Maybe I can uh, just disable the flat menus. Uh, there's a configuration option for that. We'll see, we will see. So let's open up this section of the website that does have Actually, the, that does have the menu code. That's under our templates here. We actually have a nav bar template, which is just hard coded in HTML. Ah, yeah. And I have some custom logic in there too that uh, throws a little bit of a wrench into the deal. Maybe, maybe not. Actually, I can just pop that out. Uh, in other words, we need to see if a user is subscribed, and if they're not, then we show them a subscribe link, which is hard coded. I can pull this part out, or more specifically, I can pull this out. And replace it with the main menu code. Let's see if this works. Okay, why is my undo not working? flat menu. I don't have a template, but all right, that's cool. It would just be four item in the menu. Do this. Oh, oh, after that. 
yeah, I'd like to now just define another menu. So getting the kind of jump and not making the jump between how I get this menu items into the context. So it has an active class so you can highlight the page that you're on. That's cool. Which we won't have on the subscribe link. Let's just see if this works. I don't know how this menu items comes into the menu, uh, into the context, and I'm probably just not reading closely enough. right there so I might not need this tag at all but how does it know the main menu no, I don't think that's gonna work actually let's just take Load the menu tags and iterate through the items. Come on. So then we just need to tell the template.
main menu show multiple levels is false. Check that this menu is assigned to the site. So you can't assign, it says you can assign into the site a main menu. What? So this is maybe your, I don't know. Oh, I see. There it is. I got it. All right. I was confused. The main menu is only applied to this to one site. All right. Good. Just new learning curve stuff. So let me delete that site now. But it's not rendering. Why is it not rendering? installation steps correctly. You know, it could be the problem. Now, this is regular Django templating stuff. So It's used in my base uh, template or whatever, but uh, I mean, it has full logic. To render things conditionally and yeah, so it's a regular old template, Django template. That's not the case. That this is being treated def differently. Probably the case is that I haven't installed it correctly. So let me go back to those installation steps. Pebcac. Okay, so I did install it in the package uh, in the project. I've added it in the installed apps. Okay, settings. Installed apps. Like to use context processors there. I did have a copy and paste error earlier, so let me just Oh come on. Check that. Here's that. Do 
Wagtail menus. Don't repeat if it's already there. Ah, model admin. So yeah, very carefully need to read this stuff. No, it's there. Alright, alright. I ran all the migrations, but let's just specify. Huh, I wonder what model has a chain. I don't know. I'm changing any. going on I think these are just some things I forgot to migrate. Okay. And I did run this. Site switcher will appear in the top right. I can't read all the docs up front. There's the certain art to skimming, but uh, eventually I got to come back. But I figured these things out slowly. All right. Well, I don't know if the show and menu is true is the issue because, 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 because. rendering this like raw string which is pretty confusing there it's like an escaped HTML rather than uh, rendering the block the templating language is like not picking it up properly although these conditional blocks are working and I've imported Menu tags. Huh. All right, so here we go. Main menu allows you to display the main menu defined for the current site in your Wagtail project with CSS classes automatically applied to each item to indicate the current page or ancestors of the current page. It also does other few sensible things like never adding the ancestor class on page like so we load the menu tags load menu tags and we say main menu perhaps 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 my template path is wrong But this template's directory, this everything here is at the root. So you don't need a prefix of a menus.
Max levels is not required. So we are just saying. Not to show other levels. And template, it's main menu HTML. Looking, it was looking hopeful, but then an hour in, I can't get the dang, dang plug in to work. What if I just put in another, t another uh, template like the home page? the things are rerunning. Yeah, it's just not working, man. Bummer. Let's try putting in the preferred. like I'm not picking up these changes either. Oh yeah, I did it too. Maybe there's a note on compatibility. Is there some sort of compatibility issue?
This has got to be the problem. I probably have done this wrong. In the template setting. So here's installed apps. Options, context processor. Templates, no. This is not there. Maybe without settings, you can pull up the site settings. Hmm, interesting. It's subtle. Want to play migration? I just need to migrate that field. so frustrating when I'm, you know I haven't done everything perfectly by the docs I've gone through multiple times though I just don't know what else could be missing why is this rendering to a string why is not rendering in this template to begin with the home page template it's in the block content not even rendering the template string uh, the tag or the content so I'm not quite sure what to do Okay, great. I just need to take a small break. We're on to something now. And I might just not be able to do it this way. I might have to figure out another way of including into the navigation menu, which is all right. But I'll be back in a few minutes. I'm going to start some water boiling. I'm almost out of tea here. I just need a quick bio break. Thank you very much for hanging out on the stream and being patient while I scratch my head and figure out this uh, unforeseeably complicated issue with getting a wagtail plug-in work. I'll be right back.
All right, thanks for bearing with me. So I think I have a couple of issues going on here, making it difficult to reason about this and figure it out. First, this navigation menu is rendering somewhere in the render pipeline uh, where you might not be able to sort of include sub elements. I don't know. I'll have to look at if this is a factor of how the project is organized. But the other thing is, this uh, these menu tags don't seem to be working to a certain extent. At least in this context, menu items are supposed to be passed in here. So it's a little bit baffling. I wish they had just like a demo project for this. Now it says Wagtail version is 20 to 27. Django 2.2, which I think we're like at 2.2.8. We haven't upgraded to 3 yet, so I think that shouldn't be a problem. Oh. Just see if this is necessary, if this has any difference, any effect. So that still works, and this still doesn't render. All right, here's a feeble attempt. One thing, I might be able to look on GitHub for projects where this is used and see how they've implemented it. And just sometimes discover some cool projects, open study room, UK Recovery Fest. this server when I was playing Go a little bit more often. I kind of decided not to play Go as much. What we'll look for here is menu tags. Oops, wrong button. Yeah, they're using it right in their site base, just like I'm trying to do. All right. More or less. I mean, yeah. Using it in the template, that's kind of interesting. They just say main, main menu.
I think we're we'll looking for an energy menu item. These are tests. So apparently web can use templates. Right. Templates. Menus. Main menu.html. I don't need this. I might also double check the content. This is tricky, but uh, I'm leading to confusion. But if I go back to the pages, the welcome page, I have to. This is um, makes sense, but it's a little bit. If I'm already explicitly adding it to a menu, then it should kind of uh, just work. Okay. Yeah, that's the case. All right, so none of those had been marked as joining the menu. So there we go. So what's going on now? This is not working still. All right. At this point, I'm kind of getting past the threshold of like um, having, you know, saving time by importing an existing library versus just writing my own sort of menu management plugin. I mean, this should just work. I, th I think I can get this to work. working here now so if we're good to go I need to figure out why this context processor is not interpolating the main menu
strange thing is that the templates inside of the sort of the core module, this WF website is the core, the project, uh, my base uh, template can definitely use, you know, things to interpolate. I can include tags, I can render HTML with these tags that get included and load static. There's a difference there. What was that? How did I get that? Oh, I don't know what that. What if I try that? Load static. Oh, I don't want this in the home template, so let's go and clean this up now. So maybe it just works now, though. That's cool. Looking one more project, how they're doing it. This should just work. I'm including it.
there were oh man could be that that argument was in there was incorrect yeah or that breaking across multiple lines anyway it's working oh boy that was crazy All right, so now I just need to go back to the content and tell each of them to display in the menu, which is okay, and that's fine. a whole bunch of clicks but okay we're not going to be doing this very often community events i think i already did yeah, yeah. Uh, but this subscribe uh, is a conditional Now we'll just mess with the markup. And I'm going to try another feature today. <laughs> One and a half hours. All right, no problem. So I just need to add that class, that nav item class. We should be good to go. Now the active class, also I have to look at the bootstrap active class. Property. No, oh, active. All right. Let's first just check this rendering out. Uh, did I want to save it? We can see here, this is a nav item inside of the nav bar. So that is correct. But it should be appearing like this. So what's the difference? Ah, nav link. All right. If we go, we're at the home page, so let's go to the magazine page and see if it's active. It's a little bit bold, yes. Active. Cool, all right. <laughs> let's call it good. I think I'm fine with the a little bit of convoluted workflow. Um, 
it might, might be a feature of those who, uh, uh, the complicated workflow being you have to, when publishing the page or the item, mark it as being published in the main menu, which is natural. That's, uh, I guess, what that was there for. And then add it to the menu. But it seems like there should be, when you add something to the menu, it should be marked. Maybe a hook could call that. Or maybe that's a design decision, an intentional decision. Cool. Anyway, my chai tea is ready. Let's go and add a little bit of milk. Now I'm going to an herbal chai. So let's go ahead and commit these. What did I change here? So the home page, I somehow it linted it. I don't want to commit that. I hope this is not going to become an issue of linting all my HTML files in an ugly way. Well, this is okay. No, 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 this is not good. Great, and we've uh, got the code on GitHub. Oops, wrong. Desktop. So this is issue 31. Okay. Pull request for issue 31. these and we'll start on another another feature there Good, I think we're synced up locally. Issues. Let's take a little bit of a close look at the contact form. I hope <laughs> this will be a low hanging fruit. The previous one I thought was gonna be a low hanging fruit because we had a module already. In the end, I guess it was, it was only a few lines, but some struggling to get there. Mainly the learning curve, I suppose, but there's some other, yeah, I think it's all just boils down to learning curve. All right, some stuff I was doing wrong. But, uh, I think multiple, putting these on multiple lines is in valid syntax, firstly. Um, but it seems like um, 
the add submenus thing didn't really work that good. All right, so let's look at Wagtail forms. How do we do this? There's a form builder. Set up single page form, such as a contact us form, which is form, which is exactly what we want. A set of base models that site implementers can use can extend to create their own form page. Site specific templates. Once a page type has been set up in this way, editors can build forms within the visual page editor. Ooh, that's cool. Hey, what's up, Dyslexico TV? Any chance I know anything about COBOL? Hmm. I know how to spell it. Because you just spelled it for me. Now, uh, I don't know. What do you want to learn about COBOL? So, I might be able to explore some, some COBOL with you. Uh, are you got, do you have some code you're trying to review or trying to debug? I am probably at the point I should learn COBOL. Having a hard enough time though with uh, JavaScript and Python. Let's Google it and see it's open source or not. Mm, it's a standard, isn't it? ANSI, NISO. Is there an open source implementation? It's got a lot of developers. Oh, 1960. TV says, basically I had a teacher teach us about three total hours of it and then give us a final. Hmm. I could build the second program since it was just using if statements. Okay. But the first part seems to be trumping me. Okay, cool. Uh, firstly, why is your teacher teaching you COBOL? Is this an entry level programming course? I think uh, it, they should be teaching you JavaScript or Python or Java at the entry level. At the basics. No, it was a business dev course. Okay. Still, though. Python, JavaScript, Java, yeah. All right, but anyway, that, that aside, do you have some code examples or what's the um, what's the assignment? The whole course was about system analysis. She's not a very good teacher. Okay, well, yeah, can you send a snippet and I uh, can I show that snippet on the stream? Is it your code? All right. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to d diss a uh, cool ball by any means, but I think um, what I'm getting at is that a lot of tools in the primary development eco developer ecosystem right now is um, not COBOL. Trending languages are Dart and Rust. The fastest growing. The top is JavaScript and Python, though. And Java d dropped out. So really, yeah, that, that's what you should be looking at, Python and JavaScript, depending on where you're heading. If you're doing an, like business analysis and data work, it's Python. If you're doing web architecture, uh, cross-platform apps and stuff, it's probably JavaScript. Java also does cross-platform apps, but it's Declining in popularity. All right. I'm going to look at some of this off stream because I'm not sure about the origin of this information. Copy link location. All right, data division.
uh, just out of curiosity, what's your goal here for learning COBOL or for taking this course, I should actually say, ask? Copy link location. Is this a requirement for some kind of a business degree? Complete and modify the program so that it accepts the operator symbol. Plus, minus, slash, or star. It uses the evaluate to discover which operator has been entered. <clears throat> and apply that operator to the two numbers entered. Use the condition. So let's see. Accept operator. So I guess accept operator. Yeah, let me just pop it over here on the stream. Boing, 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 boing. So this is the code and some advertisements. Good grief. I need an ad blocker. They just get distracting and they can't concentrate. They're not relevant. All right, so you accept an operator. So is this operator class? Is there just a, hmm, I'm not even sure where to turn to for COBOL stuff. Stack Overflow. Well, I think that by accepting operator here, is this just allowing only those specific types? Plus, minus, star, or slash. So what, how do you debug this code? Or how are you running it? Can we run COBOL online? One cool thing about you know like JavaScript and Python is you just run it in a REPL. JDoodle. Yeah, can you paste your code into this? Where did I go? Oh boy. Paste your code here into jdoodle.com. GNU COBOL, okay, very nice. That'll help to kind of debug it. That way you get rapid feedback. The cool thing about using these interpreted languages is you see your output right away and you can tweak it and experiment and make mistakes at a faster rate. Oh yeah, sorry, uh, paste your code there and then. <laughs> uh, okay, I thought you could share with me. Sorry, it does half-baked effort. This is cool. Here, come here. Come to this this uh, room. Now this is cool. J Doodle. And together JS is an open source uh, JavaScript project. Hey, what's up? I see your mouse cursor. Whoa. Let's see if I can change my name here. <laughs> That's pretty tight. Okay. So we invited you. It has, uh, looks like it's got mic microphone chat. Uh, I have my desktop audio muted. Wild Wolf. Okay, so identification division. So program ID, does that have to be a meaningful thing? Working storage selection. 
procedure. So the procedure is like defining a function. The name is division. But that also seems like a funny name for the procedure because it seems like you're doing different things. than division or calculate result. Those are the different things in the code, yeah. Doesn't actually mean division. Calculate result is what we're, so what is this evaluate? Where do you define calculate result? Everything inside of Everything inside of evaluate becomes yeah. All right, cool. So you added everything inside of evaluate. Is this your code? Can you see my highlights on that um, live coding thing? Yes, pretty much. Okay. So the first thing can we just I'm going to destroy your code a little bit here. Just display some text. Does this work? And what's with the indentation abnormalities? Normal indentation. Attention to detail. Let's just see. This works. This is how I roll. Just really rudimentary stuff, but just work your way up into the layers of the problem, making sure that each step of the way that things are working correctly. Sometimes you have to back up and go forward. Then I don't have this character on my keyboard. Well, I do, but it's like hidden somewhere. All right, all right, all right, all right. Hmm. Now we need to execute it, but how do we, um, J, doodle in action, error, Enter is not defined. And is not defined. Oh, uh, well, here's the problem, I think. So we got some strange quotations. The quotation marks are curly. I don't know if this is the whole problem with the code. Received is not defined. Yes, yeah, so how do you just print? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And it just takes a string up to that, right? Maybe if I just do I have my quotes mixed up? What's the what is with no advance? Oh, here's the problem. I had an extra quote there. And now I don't have a quote here. Grief. 
operator is not defined. Okay, so then we need to pass in an argument. What did you do, like operator? How do you pass in the command line argument? You gotta help me out here because I've not worked with Coolball. It's getting harder and harder to browse the web in 2020 and going into 2020. I just, it's just like a really unenjoyable experience with advertisements and popovers. How are you executing this code locally? How do you comment out code in COBOL? What did it do before you added your stuff? What did it look like? I mean, You have to define variables before they are uh, used or something? Stretch for a second. Oh, we got to see. Okay. Hmm. Would, but I hope I don't have to work with COBOL anytime soon. It's just not very familiar. I think it, if maybe it was familiar, I'd be okay with it. Just learning C language families, maybe. All right, so you got, uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna go ahead and copy it cut everything up here. Just, so this should work, data division, working sword section. And then you define a procedure. Oh, why did my cursor jump up there? Oh, I think identification, division. Then you need a procedure division. We 
will need this to be interactive, it seems. Because it's asking us, it's prompting us. Error, unexpected literal. Expecting, oh, okay. Line three, data division. Execute, is it ready? Hmm, this is some heavy code, gotta compile it. Oh, it doesn't print anything. can stop the execution so it got stuck it didn't ever get into this procedure how do you get it into the procedure how did it work on your end and where did run start Get some kind of example code from Yvonne Shear, but medium is going to nag us. Here's some good HTML without CSS. No, it's a little bit CSS. The shortest COBOL program ever. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right. So let's just try this. Let me get a, a scratch pad up here. So I don't lose. Oh, I have a scratch pad over here. I'll just say cobol dot cobol. Is that the extension you use? Cobol? Are you doing something? All right, you got mixed quotes. So that won't work. You're using those curly quotes. All right. Let me just paste this simple thing here, all right? Let me just try this. The shortest program is a hello world, a COBOL hello world. All right. But now I've lost you. And terminalitis, or tabitis, paste, execute. I did it. Spurious dollars detected. Ooh, I like some spurious dollars. What are spurious? What does that mean? S P U R O U S. Hmm. Not being what it purports to be false or fake. No, I don't want spurious dollars then. Dang. Well, maybe there are spurious. Maybe spurious. Money is spurious. But then you need that spurious money to work. Can't work without it. Line not terminated by a new line. There we go. All right, now we have some spurious money. What if I just take that spurious line away? I did it! All right, so now we have this procedure. So paste your, oh darn, you've done this before. Hmm, let me double check here. 
I had my I have my sc uh, scratch pad over here. Let's try accepting arguments. Are you wanting this to take command line arguments or? So that's gonna work. Maybe you'll get extra credit. So let's go ahead. Uh, read the requirements again. So it'll do each of them. You have multiple arguments, that's cool. Just separated by space, space delineated. Now, what we're gonna do is in here, boom, right here. Paste your code for that conditional, if it's a plus, print plus, just that. Nothing more, just one time. I lost it in the shuffle. So then this will be arg instead of operator now. And do we use indentation here? Firstly, what is going on here with the indentation? Uh, let's just display One step at a time. So we'll say Testarossa. Oh, goodness. Uh, I see the problem. It's trying to be too helpful and put those quotes in there for me. Do you need a period at the end of each line? Does it need punctuation? No. What's going on here? Conditional expression. Good. IBM. Why are, why are you using when instead of if? Also, this might need to be a string. Uh, because we're actually, this is just a string in the code. Please don't be helpful. I need anything. Why did, why did you? Is this an assignment or is that a comparison operator? All right. Let's do two args. Okay. 
Yes. All right, so we're good. We're good. Uh, check it out. Let's so let me let me think for a second here. So your your goal is to have two an operand and two numbers to operate on. We're probably gonna need some type coercion. Um, these are coming in from the command line of strings. It accepts an operator symbol. Uses evaluate to discover which operator has been entered and to apply that operator when two numbers are entered to the two numbers entered. And this is some low-level stuff. So I would think at a higher level about how to do this. Um, you know, you'll take two numbers and an operator, right? So if you can assume that the user will enter those in the correct order, number one, number two, an operator, then we might be able to just, that's error prone. This is just, I don't, we don't have enough new action. We just have a string. Q 
Good grief. Yeah, this is... Let's see if it has just how it goes the other way. It looks like they're defining the format here. Oh man. Well, yeah, I guess easy is relative. It seems so easy, just not used to the syntax. Yeah. So what if we do this? Let me just try something. How do you define just variables here? So. if we just want to hard code these variables. All right, do you know how to use X? If we, 
So what we have is an alpha, here, let me just sketch this out. This is pseudocode, but uh, so we need our data division right here. And instead of args, we'll have, do you have to put numbers in before there? In, be, in a operand? Yeah, the numbers, they have different meanings. Okay, so the level number is always going to be zero, 01, it looks like. That's too advanced. This is some um. example code. So we don't need arg anymore, we're just going to have operand and two numbers. And how do you assign now these variables? So the operand will be, for example, plus one, one. All right, just hypothetically, it's maybe not even what your teacher is asking for, but. Oh, A to Z plus blank, no. X. At the, of the character set. The corresponding position, position in the picture. What if we want this to be, we don't want 10 of those. All right, so this is defining the character set. Is that how that works? You know, I really don't have an idea how this is working, so I gotta be honest. If you have a Python or, or JavaScript question, but COBOL is just not anything I've ever encountered.
like I'm having to use just very rudimentary lookups and I keep coming back to IBM This is one. We don't need the arguments, so sorry, uh, but uh, for going back and forth on this. It's a Joomla website. And does this you have to have this specificity here? Or? We want this picture to be for an operator to be. Mm, but let's just do all So there's functions for divide, subtract, multiply. The thing is, they have each they have different signatures. Subtract number one from number two, giving result. Multiply number one by number two, giving result. Divide number one into number two, giving result. I understand that that's the natural English way of expressing it, but uh, it makes it difficult to have to memorize a, a case for each of those operators when really it's just first number operator, second number. But the problem being operator is just a string and that won't make sense to the computer. So we'll have to, uh, yeah, I couldn't think of a way to make that in eval or something in JavaScript work. All right.
compute result. So we need this, this line here. So let's go back to your code. When operator equals, I believe you need this string here, plus. Indentation is kind of being funny here. Okay. Are values immutable? No, wait. Hey, what's up, level two? Uh, which site? How's that site going? Oh man, level two, have you ever worked with COBOL? We're, I'm actually on this huge deviation now and uh, we're trying to uh, debug some COBOL. <laughs> so today we're supposed to be working on the Western Friend website. I can try this COBOL for just a little bit longer, but uh, it just looks like I, I'm not going to have a lot more time on this. I, I want to work on the main project I'm doing, and COBOL is not anything I have experience with. Uh, so just acknowledge that. All right. So oh. this result is not defined, right? That's basically what I'm getting. Level two says, what are you using COBOL for? Yeah, I don't know. Dyslexic Taco TV has a uh, programming assignment for their like and business analytics class. And uh, the teacher, yeah, the teacher is uh, not given helpful feedback. They didn't really provide them with the knowledge necessary to solve the problem. So we are just trying to create a COBOL program that does a bunch of stuff. I, I'm losing the requirements here, but first it needs to accept an operator symbol, plus, minus, division, or multiplication. Then it evaluates to discover what kind of operator. Then it uses one condition, valid operator to identify the valid operators, and only displays the result that the operator is valued. I suppose if we work through those in order, but yeah. It's just for a course. What's the course? Are you? Can you drop it? <laughs> Did you take a JavaScript boot camp or Python boot camp or something?
So the first thing is we need to use evaluate to discover which operator has been entered and apply that operator to the two numbers entered. And I think you already had this code going on there. So let's just start there. Sounds like city skylines out there. Now, what does it evaluate true? What's the true here? Is that just, it's looking for truthiness? Makes sense. So operator equals plus. Compute. And display dot compute result equals where did that go? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm on a different tab if you're chatting to me. The condition name valid operator. Yeah, I have no idea, man. I have no idea. But the first thing I would, I would do is move, so just in terms of your code real quick, and you can kind of see that's what I'm doing here. Um, the repeating parts, move those out of the code. So this display enter a single digit number, display enter a single digit number, just enter, is uh, spread throughout the four things, all of these operator conditions, I think you should be able to just get them before, get them in one place, get the first and second number, and then have the code that actually changes, and, you know, do that inside of your, your evaluate. Uh, I don't know how to do this step number C, step letter C or whatever, valid operator, uh, but I can try to get one, I can try to get this to work. Unexpected operator. And yeah, there's a lot of curly quotes going on in these things. All right, coming back to the stream chat. Um, Dyslexic Tacos TV says, I don't, I didn't know this would be in the course. And it's the last part of it. All right, cool. Yeah, I mean, I would really just talk to your teacher about this assignment and um, see if you can do it in a different programming language or I don't know it was the course itself on COBOL or it's just this one assignment like a hit you out of the blue COBOL assignment and again I'm not trying to harsh on COBOL but it's just very esoteric uh, as I guess any programming languages but it's not in widespread use so your avenues for support are narrow and corporate these IBM and things like that. If that's where you're wanting to go in your career, then that maybe makes sense. You would learn COBOL. Uh, all right, I'm going to switch away from this. Back to your code and just look at this. So what we're doing here is add result equals. Where's my curve? My add. Oh, over here. Add. Add first number to second number. Well, this is pretty good. I like that. And then do you need a dot here? So the result is not defined. Um, 
invalid picture character L. Line not terminated by new line. These are some mysterious. So 31, number eight. Level two learn. Level two says COBOL is a language mostly used in the past. So as a fellow programmer, we still must pay respect to it, which I see you doing. But with your own opinion, I still like to say it out of influence or frustration. Using it. Yep, we might be without it one day. Yes. I just think, uh, to repeat this, this for pedagog pedagogical purposes and for career development, I don't think we should be teaching people COBOL as their first language right now at this in 2020 nearly. Um, if you need to main, you know, get some programming skills and use a high level abstract like these common languages we have that we, that are wide and widespread use, then when the need be, comes apparent that you're gonna have to work with legacy code base, develop the skills at that point, but just learning a code as a part of a business program, I think this is a misguided exercise. It's not just the language, it's not just COBOL, it's like the, the, I think the exercise misses, misses the purpose of just teaching somebody to code. And this style of coding is not common almost in any of the major languages. And we did look at the common languages at the beginning of this session, you know, Java, uh, we, we saw a Dart uh, as an up and coming language. Um, you've got um, JavaScript, Python, um, PHP, C++, C Sharp, Swift. You know, this is unlike any of those languages. So as a pet, again, as a pedagogical instrument, COBOL is not a good first step if you're trying to enter industry, almost any industry or processing data, unless you're, you know you'll be dealing with legacy code, which is why I asked Dyslexic T Taco what the goal is of learning COBOL. Can you help us debug this program level two? Like what these errors are so... Invalid picture character L. So we need to, the operator to be a string. And we don't know the length of the, the number of sort of significant digits in the output. You could import, you could input any, um, any two in integers. I think this is all, this is why a very confusing L assignment. College is a misguided exercise as a grad student. And then they will tell you, I don't know, COBOL. COBOL. So you didn't use, you didn't predefine that operator. Ah, where'd the thing go? So what if I do this? Okay. And earn an operator symbol with no advancing. Accept operator evaluate operator. What does the with no advancing do? Yeah, I'm not disrespecting it in any way. Again, the, so I don't know why you're hammering that point. I'm saying that this is not a good pedagogical tool. 
right now. It's sort of actually stymieing the learning process and it's not setting the student up for a path that is in common uh, practice in the development industry. And I don't know what um, dyslexic tacos learning goals are here or what the course's goals are. I don't have any of that information. So, but yeah, no respect to, to COBOL. I'm not in any way disrespecting it. I just don't know how it works. You can see my frustration showing. What is n with no advancing? So COBOL. It doesn't have to be upcase. So I think the with no advancing is there to keep the cursor from moving while the user inputs. Is that correct? Oh yeah. So level two says I respect all old school language because we don't know what language might not be there. Yeah. So we and we definitely want to build on the past. I think um, keep things. And level two says I agree with you on your opinion. There are a lot of language that. So I think the programmers, gods for high level languages and maybe the curse is a troll with a name like that. Yeah, it's nice to have these high-level abstractions and not have to be thinking about, you know, cursors and the precision of decimal degrees before you, you use them. So, it looks like with no advancing, you're using it every time you're accepting input from the user. And do you put a period at the end of that? All right, can copy and paste that. I just want this part to at least work where I can get the dang input, right? That should work. Let's see if I have... Mm, operator is not defined. Yeah, that's right, because I haven't, if I'm thinking imperatively, I haven't received it. Okay, this is just a little bit too big. There we go. Accept operator, evaluate operator. And then, do I need a period there? Oh, goodness. Maybe that's it. So if you have a full stop, then it's like new sentence. No. 19. 2021. And you didn't predefine operator here. How did you get it? Did you have these similar errors there? Uh, dyslexic taco? Hmm. And I don't know. Gosh, good gosh, we're like three hours into the live stream and I need to do this second feature. So I'm really sorry, I can't uh, help here. Um, trying to think of a good good place. Uh, we really need to ask people who are familiar with uh, COBOL, but Stack Overflow is not really, it comes to mind, but it's not really so geared towards just helping, you know, like homework help type questions. Uh, you have to get very specific and have something to re you know reproduce the issue. Yeah, the dyslexic talk talkers get a chatter. <laughs> that would be a funny course name. Um, let's see if there's like coding. You know, there's something code buddies should be handling. Like uh, we help each other learn to code, but you got to have some specific knowledge here. Uh, A lot of these are just kind of spammy sites, it seems like.
Reddit might be a good one. There's a COBOL subreddit. Oh. I think it would be unwise to have it your first and only language you know. It's very limited in job opportunity and career growth, but if you want to learn it after knowing more, ubiquitous language is not unwise. So, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that, but... There is a learning, what is this? There's a COBOL subreddit. How do I get to the dang subreddit? Here we go. I think you should turn to this community, albeit it's not super active. If you don't mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, dyslexic taco, I've tried to answer this question. I have no idea where to begin, really. These people could probably help me a little bit better. But if uh, dyslexic taco, if you're still here, and if you're wanting to learn uh, some other programming techniques and languages, I'm available to help with tutoring and, and pair programming in Python and JavaScript. I'm not sure if, how to see if uh, Dyslexic Taco is still here. I guess they were gone. <laughs> They've taken off. All right, I just show level two learn. Okay, back to the challenge, level two. <laughs> Man, we tried. Give it a good college try, as they say. Oh boy, that was just not fun, though. <laughs> I think the not fun is not because of COBOL; it's because of unfamiliarity. That's what you know. In struggle, that's when programming is not fun. So you have to. That's why it's really, I think, good that we have we're able to ease into problems. I think um, operate just beyond our comfort zone, you know, just it's challenging enough, but we can solve it. We're not sort of deadlocked uh, with just unknown unknowns. And I think that was part of the problem that um, Dyslexic Taco is facing, that their teacher didn't give them enough sort of context and background about how to solve the problem, it sounded like even. Um, so it's not even that COBOL is more esoteric or mysterious or sort of uh, less popular language, I'm trying to say. Right now, it's just that the learning environment wasn't providing the nutrients or the information necessary to, you know, to progress to the next level up there. Um, all right, so let's. So what we're trying to do is to define a contact us form. So I'm sorry if uh, that section of the live stream was a little bit less in than interesting, but you can <laughs> use it as a good example of seeing the frustration that emerges when you're too far out of your comfort zone and when a coder is just like totally not even able to do really rudimentary things in a language and i haven't had that level of frustration with with wagtail and django and python i've had more time to immerse myself in those languages and just fairly good documentation and things like that all right, so we're gonna create a contact form. Let's check our master branch to see if it's been... What's up to date? Oh yeah, I have this COBOL file. Didn't even use it. Level two, if you're still there, what have you been up to lately? Sorry, uh, was really focusing on that uh, project. Are you still, uh, were you wanting to work on that music uh, program this weekend? I have some time tomorrow, we can go, we can do a session. I wanna get a couple of uh, tasks done for Western Friend, but I, I can stream around uh, eight o'clock Eastern Europe time and do some more of that music. I found a really cool thing. Love 2 says, pretty good, doing some stream with a new game. Thinking about removing those signs in my game and replacing them with 
sound and color games profile picture with no animation. Also working on a visual GUI for the back end of my Twitch extension. But yeah, I'll be here if you're here. Very cool. Let me use the restroom real quick. Uh, I'll show you this really cool thing I found um, relating to the Tonnets, Tonnets project, and I'll get back into the Wagtail. Uh, thanks for hanging out. I'll be right back. All right, thanks for hanging out. I'm back. I just found this project. Dude, I've lost it. <laughs> I started. Let me just check out my stars. Check this out. Uh, this is basically what we were, we were trying to build. I should fork it, really. Uh, it's been updated recently, even. Um, let's just take a look real quick. I'll enable my desktop audio. You might get a little bit of echo. But it's first thing you do is you can click it. Oh, oh. For the open access to MIDI. Well, Try this in Chrome browser. I think it's a, it's a Chrome thing, probably just not. Well, this is Chromium. Oh. Oh. Basically, it's just really a far along project. It's played through direct manipulation, through clicking and touch. I have tested it, I tested it in Firefox, I guess. And it has MIDI output, so you could Hypothetically, use it as a MIDI controller. MIDI support is not present in your browser. You can still use your computer's keyboard. Well, the computer keyboard is not working either. Oh, there it is. I almost, I swear that I had found one that, uh, that you could click and that had audio output. Uh, I'm still using SVG and, and I think this uses SVG also. And I was reading articles of why SVG is one of the best like user interface languages available. It's so flexible and designers can work with it directly. Uh, so I really think we shouldn't be doing UI and code. I'm more and more believing that every time I look at React code, uh, it's it fragments the user interface uh, and presents a really big barrier to entry uh, for people who are visually inclined and have visual authoring tools like Illus uh, yeah, Adobe Illustrator or Inkscape. Um, so there's a whole large pool of talent who can't really work directly to improve the user interface when, when it's done through fragmented render functions and stuff like that. I don't think that's a good move for the industry. I think this program does render the SVG programmatically though. I haven't delved too much into the code. But the cool things I like about it, that it has MIDI capabilities so that it actually, actually can send uh, those signals to other um, software. Um, it seemed like I had found one that you could record 
the output. My stars. Maybe this is not the one. Oh, it could be this one, in fact. No. Well, just knowing my luck, I've actually just... Oh, this is sorting by when they were updated. Shoot. Yeah, because it was like a compositional tool. And I think uh, one of the cool things to add to it would be some sort of a multiplayer where multiple people could record this. Damn it. Like using t together JS or something like that. Actually, that might work. Have you seen, uh, so yeah, what, what are your thoughts on the SVG level two? I mean, are you strongly opposed to it or is it just something that It's not too controversial. So this is cool that that live coding session uses together JS. This might be fun for a collaborative musical environment. Uh, a couple of people playing a tonnets. Yeah, the SVG looks nice. I agree that for design. Uh, yeah, do I have the SVG on repeat like this one? No, I haven't actually made the tone of SVG, so that's the that's the um, challenge. And I think it would tile differently as you move through this pitch, pitch space. I don't really know. I don't understand how it's constructed, to be honest. I used Vue.js, so maybe if I could just throw a bunch of keywords in there. No, no, no. I actually found it while I was researching an answer for some Stack Overflow thing, so, uh, or uh, Y Combinator. Let me see if I can find that document. I, I, I pasted my notes. Oh, here it is. File, open, recent. Music learning path. Uh, sort of, uh, there was this question on, I'll, I'll share the screen real quick. on uh, Hacker News about how to learn uh, music theory. And I don't know if there's like a lot of things to music theory. It's a little very deep and broad and branching field, but uh, there is a, some progressive ways to get into some very interesting territory relatively quick. And then there's these web hexachord. I think this is the project. So how do I just hide that now? Dang it. Rename that. We'll remove it. All right, so here's the project I just found. Please be the right project. Yes, here we go. This, I think, is already what we're aiming at with the uh, Tonus project. 
Uh, so you can see they don't extend it across the home page, but I do click it. Let me just unmute my desktop audio. When you click the triangle, it plays multiple tones, but you can't hear the desktop audio unless it's through my speakers, I suppose. Or my microphone, I mean, excuse me. And when I click a tone, it just plays that tone. Somehow you can go to different arrangements of the same key. Those are bad. Bad sounding. So one, three, five. Oh, this is the number of C, E, G. All right. Very cool. One key, many representations. It's multilingual. It can load and record. It can rotate. Oh, that was actually playing it back. <laughs> This is crazy. It's called Web Hexcore. Let me just send you this. It's open source. It's built with, uh, I didn't mention this, Vue.js. So we were thinking about adding a reactive layer to it. Uh, I think we should really collaborate with this project. Um, it's nuts. It has MIDI export. This is so cool. Then you can bring it into your other program. And there's a, we could really just add a couple more uh, sort of interfaces, the musical interfaces. I don't even know what all it can do. Oh my goodness. It's yeah, very much, very mind boggling. Where is the source code though? Well, it's web hexacord. Oh yeah, of course. And I think it's over here. Right here. And it just seems to have flatlined a little bit. Uh, not that bad, but uh, a couple contributors haven't been working on it very much recently. So we can maybe fork it or who knows. It's GPL version 3 licensed. So that's cool. Strong copy left. I was already thinking about licensing the taunts there. Uh, let's see. Oh, level 2 asks Discord. What? Your Discord link? I think to add these links to your Discord. Wait, no, I have a better way. Okay, what's your better way, love to? <laughs> I have the Discord running, I can share the link with you. Man, I, had, I kind of feel bad now about not being able to help with that COBOL thing, but good grief. I am not the right person for that, unfortunately. I'd like to be able to help with multiple languages. I'm not that much of a polyglot. Glot. Discord. But I shouldn't shame myself for giving it an old college try. Let's see. What's your better way, though, uh, level two? Are you wanting to take notes in a different place, like a GitHub wiki or something like that? Oh, wait. I see your private message there. Okay, just uh, keeping a, A history on, so a private conversation on Twitch. That makes sense. I think at some point though, for this project to go forward, we should get into um, collaborative mode on GitHub or something like that. I'm just sorry, I'm thinking I have ADD, so my brain goes off before, in the middle of my sentences all the time. But that is a nice project. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, what I'll do, What we should do is fork it, I believe, and add one issue, just one issue, to enable together JS. What do you think? Let's give it a try. So two people could play the tonnets if that would even work. I don't know if it has the same input and output. Just to try that out, <laughs> this would be cool. Then you could jam. You could have multiple instruments jamming at the same time, recording the jam session to MIDI, and then sharing that MIDI on a server-based app. Oh man. I'll send you the link to TogetherJS. 
Um, should we create a GitHub organization? Let me set this up off air. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to the, um, again, this is another digression in what I'm trying to do. We've got a history of this chat. I'm going to work on form builder. So it's after 11 o'clock. Level two says, hold on. Oh, you had a, are there advertisements in this stream? Testing one, two, three. Okay, yeah, I, I guess I, yeah, that's the default thing with Twitch. I did, I did get a, some kind of notification for, now I have 52 followers. So I, they asked me to verify myself, basically. So I went through some steps after the, the after that process. Cool build beans. Let's do some form builder stuff. Uh, level two. I don't know if you heard me say this earlier, but are you available tomorrow? Can we have a dedicated live stream to this music app tomorrow? I can get a couple things ready in advance, and we'll just focus on that for one or two hours. Maybe adding multiplayer feature. Oh. Form builder. We need Wagtail Contrib form. Needed to create a new branch locally. Contact us. Contact form. From master. Yeah, I can give it two hours. All right, I'll stream tomorrow on my little widget below the video uh it's in uh, finland time 8 p.m this is what i was already planning uh i just realized though my plans for this weekend have actually changed i'll be with my son tomorrow so i, I could probably stream for one hour i don't want to leave him uh you know we like to hang out and do stuff and 8 p.m is right around his bedtime too so he would not mind having a little bit later of a bedtime like 9 p.m he's five so and i'm not super strict about it in any case but I just noticed his he, his body is, uh, that's the way his rhythm is set right now about 8 p.m. So it's good. And he, yeah. What time is it now? 11.16. So what's our time difference? Eleven yeah, 16 p.m. What's the time it'll be here when it's 9 p.m.? Hmm? It's 4 p.m. there? What's your easiest way to do it? What's your time zone? I do this. Ah, GDPR notices. Check out this one out. <laughs> I just had something pasted, copied in my thing, the bobber. All right. I'm getting tired. Must pull through. So now the contact form. DST, daylight savings time. That's just a general concept that's applied in time zones around the world. And actually, in Europe, we are getting rid of it. Woohoo! Because it, it's a pain. It's a pain in the keister. <clears throat> WF. Website settings. UTC. You're in UTC. So I'm UTC plus two or three. Hey, but yeah, Europe is getting rid of daylight savings time starting next year. Now it's up to each country to implement it or something. 
Actually, I guess it started this year. The European Parliament updated in favor of favor of removing. I'm not drunk. I don't drink. All right, each member state has until April 2020 to decide whether to remain permanently on summertime or to change their clocks back one final time to permanent standard time, also known as winter time. For this reason, all subsequent clock changes in European countries are marked as preliminary on timeanddate.com. Love these as well. Won't we notice it if we don't go along with daylight saving time? Um... You know, frankly, we notice it when we do go along with it because the time change is different in different places even. I meet with uh, a colleague in California time, and we meet every week. But twice a year when daylight savings time takes effect, they, I think it happens first in Finland and then in California. And inevitably, my ADD self just in my calendar uh, doesn't adjust to it uh, I'll either show up, you know, basically I show up for the meeting and it's already got, it's already happened. Yeah, something like that. So, yeah, I think getting rid of daylight savings time for me will be good. And I think that's why the European Parliament, because they knew how hard it is on me, they decided to get rid of it. <laughs> I just think in general, it's a better, it's just a move because it's causing a lot of um, difficulties. But I don't know, level two, do you meet, so what time will it be here when it's eight in Finland? It should say on the little clock below, just uh, actually, if you look on the Twitch stream down below the video, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I was thinking it's funny when people point on YouTube because they're like, click the link here. And then like nothing shows up because YouTube has changed the way happen, things happen. But in any case, that, that little, I put a calendar down there, uh, and that should, I think, tell you the time in your local time zone, if I'm not mistaken. So level two, on the stream calendar, what does it say? What time does it say for the next stream schedule? If I hop over there, I'm afraid it'll broadcast. Let me just be quiet for a minute, and I'll hop over there. Okay, basically, my countdown timer should be correct for you. It's in 15 hours. And what does it say? Oh, boy, 3 p.m. Well, I just kind of screwed that one up. Yeah, the countdown timer. And what does it say below, below Sunday for you? Does it say 3 p.m.? This is the first time I've ever started having a schedule, so I'm drawing, I'm working things out. And in my life, my, you know, off stream life schedule is prone to change like it did this weekend. So I need to update my stream schedule. 5 a.m. Really? And you're in UTC? Uh, what, if you don't mind uh, just sharing in chat what country you're in, and I will look up the difference. And I'll actually adjust this stream so that we can meet at a time that's mutually convenient because that's not mutually convenient. Share with me uh, in private uh, the country and or state you're in, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay, let me look up this. Meeting time. So right now it's at 4, 4.23 your time. I'm gonna have 
to accept some GDPR. Stuff. I don't want to enter my email. I don't want to set up an account. She wants to dang convert to time. So that's not correct. It land. All right. Oh, what's the time difference though? got a timetable here. I'll share this with you in chat. Private message. Sorry for the delay. Whoa, uptime. Okay, so the stream elements is working. Very cool. Yeah, this has been a little bit of a long stream here. Good golly. How do I get back to our private message? Here's a whisper. And essentially, it's looking like our best time for us to meet a mutually convenient time would be at around eight o'clock my time 3 p.m your time so what do you think like 2 p.m 3 p.m for this for the stream tomorrow and i'll adjust the uh, schedule two p.m or 3 p.m your time Which is actually the time I was planning on recording in any case. So how do I configure this stuff? I just added extensions. I don't know how to use them very well my extensions, stream elements, leaderboards, configure that, there we go, figuring it out, configure, I have to hit that twice. I thought I would stream a little early on Sundays, but let, yeah, so let's just change it to um, 19, I think that's, that's going to be good. Uh, 10 p.m. No, if you look at that link I sent you. Let me just uh, switch to tomorrow. One second. Where does it even show the dang cities? Oh, right there. Yeah, check out. Check this link. And make sure that the uh, 1 p.m. your time. 1 p.m. your time. Yes, yes, sorry, you were right. How about noon your time? 
I just sent that anyway. Two or three would really, three would be better. I can't do that probably that late. I can't promise. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to be too quiet and Um, yeah, let me let me come back to it. I'm just gonna I gotta work on this. Uh, at least my goal here has been to do a little bit more with this Western Friend thing. It's already almost four hours, so let me just spend about thirty more minutes working on this uh, this contact form. So I need to just put this base settings. Yeah, 1 p.m. 1 p.m. should work. That's 8 p.m. my time. All right, let me just, do, let's agree to that. Eight, 1 p.m. your time, 8 p.m. my time. So, let me hop back over to my stream configuration screen. Dashboard. Extensions. My extensions, leaderboards, Sunday. So everything is just basically 8 o'clock every day I'm broadcasting, which is pretty consistent. It makes it simple to remember. All right. Very cool. Thanks, level two, for helping me work that out. All right, let's see. Wagtail contrib forms. Let's see if this is already here. There it is. So that's mission accomplished there. Within the models of one of your apps, create a model that extends the abstract email form. Hmm. If you don't want your form page to offer any form to email functionality, which I think we don't. I mean, honestly, that's just, we're hitting so much spam, it's not even funny. What is that? Inherit from abstract form instead of abstract email form. And I'll make the to address and from address and subject fields from the content panel's definition. All right, that sounds good. Mm, I have a contact module already set up. That's cool. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's create a forms. Oh, nice. Let's create a forms app. admin we might need views but it doesn't seem like it oh so essentially I'm gonna cut cut and paste copy and paste and read I read carefully when I do this believe me mm, well let's just copy this and they're wanting it to go in models.py. All right.
Now doing this. Very cool. Oh, by the way, uh, level two, do you have, and I've already asked this, uh, do you have Visual Studio Code installed? Uh, the reason I'm asking is I've installed a live sharing plugin for VS Code. I was going to try out on the stream to see how it works for pair programming. Because it's in a tuple or something. Hmm, that's strange. My linters throwing errors. Warnings. It's right there, you go. Save that. Ah, all right. Now I figured out. All right. So it looks like the form fields are going to be defined at runtime. Form page is responsible for serving both the form page itself and the landing page after submission. So the model definition should include all necessary content fields for both of these views. Hence the thank you text. All right. Contact form. Now we need this. Some HTML there. I should be able to override these in the meta. crispy for a minute. I'll see if I can get it to render. So I think I need to migrate this now.
into the main configuration. Yeah, let me just double check where to import that from. If I look over here, for example, payment models. Django DB, not core hard. Right. That makes sense. section as uh, admin user hmm, okay don't know how to edit the form that's
to how do I add an instance of it? I think I just need to be able to add it into the home page, for example. So if I go to the front, no, here we are, the homes model. We should just be able to put it here. And then go back to that admin section and refresh. There we are. Oh, yeah, so a simple oversight. We want this to appear in the menu. Then we'll go ahead and add it to the main menu. The bottom, choosing the contact page. Save the main menu. And open this in a new tab. Boy, I'm, my batteries are low, 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 low. That worked. So that was a quick, uh, easy win. Crispy, crispy, crispy forms. Uh, where else have we used crispy there? I remember how to import that. We've used crispy. I'm getting tired. Well, we use it on the order page. I'm going to do that for field and form, do crispy type thing. So yeah, it's a little cleaner that way. I can also change the column widths, I think. If I change the meta, I can shorten these um, template names as well, and then I will call it a night. This is four hours. This is a long, long session. Form, huh? form fields. What if I just pass the form to crispy? Can that, does that just work? Template packs. Installing crispy tag because it rocks. the pipe where is it a huh, little bit better but still uh, no not very nice Come on. well 
I know the, f mm, I don't know the fields here, do I? Did it put bootstrap classes there? No, I don't think so. Bootstrap. No, let's see. All right, so there's, there's one thing. Crispy, let me see where I've used Crispy in this project before. seemed to work the registration form looked nice I think I have perhaps it's because I didn't surround it by no nope, there's a form class to the form. No. What am I doing wrong here? So perhaps this is, doesn't have the bootstrap uh, CSS. I think that's the problem here. So let me get the, uh, this needs to be part of the main template, the base template, that's why. Templates, so that won't do. I'll need to just get the template tag here. Extends base. Why would they be giving us this example here? That's kind of silly. So first I need this block title. A little bit better. There we go. Yes, we needed the. Ooh. Spring 
title tags inside the title tags. I think is the problem. Let me just double check that. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Copy and paste too much without things being confusing. And to the body, we want content. is with this form there's gonna be conditional fields and things like that so we will have to probably delve much more into this I just want to get a basic thing working in block get feedback from Mary I think we'll be okay then I don't like how it's flattening all my indentation but okay continue mm -hmm. It is working, it is working. Now what do I do? Hmm. How do I view? Wow, and it already has CSV export. Oh man, that is so cool. date and stuff like that pretty cool dude dudes and dudettes dude is dead gender neutral uh, word I guess I already have tea okay good man I'm just like so tired I'm more or less intoxicated it's just about midnight here so yeah this has been a pretty pretty good session Overall, I think in terms of uh, getting a couple of uh, big features uh, moving down the line. So I'll open a pull request for this. And uh, the next uh, Western Friend session, we're going to probably have more feedback on the contact form. So there might be, I'll have to figure out more about how to conditionally uh, display fields, which is hard when you can define the fields at runtime, isn't it? Might be a wagtail plugin for that. And then we will need to also work in the memorials section, which is the whole another feature. And we'll have filtering um, widgets and things like that in relation to uh, meetings and more more specifically the meetings actually. So we'll have to think about how to, how to limit the relationship to just Quaker meetings. Okay, well level two, thanks for stopping in. It's been cool chatting and look forward to hanging out tomorrow. Dyslexic Taco TV. Also, thank you, uh, thanks for the subscribe uh, or the follow. I'm not sure the difference of those, but in any case, the yep. And thanks for stopping in and bringing about a uh, pretty challenging uh, COBOL question, which I was defeated <laughs> defeated by. All right. Well, cool. Again, this has been a Code Buddies live coding session. Uh, yeah, if you need help with with COBOL, there I think is a. Let me see if there's a COBOL group. <laughs> and uh, code buddies, COBOL. Dang, there's not even a COBOL group over there. Well, I hope that uh, Dyslexic Taco is able to get their assignment complete <clears throat> and finish that course, and maybe they'll continue on uh, their learning journey and hang out in our chat, and we can then talk about some more. Uh, stuff where I have more fami familiarity like Python and JavaScript a little bit so cool but uh, yeah there's a lot of other great activities on codebuddies.org and it's a fully open source platform so if you're wanting to get started on a, a new project from the ground up um, you can join our current development endeavors 
where we're rewriting code base with new features and capabilities. Okay, well, thank you very much for watching and have a great day.